Welcome everybody from uh, different places in the world, different time zones. So thank you all for joining this meeting. Uh, I'm very happy that we can now start this second talk of this uh, uh, flamboyant uh, seminar series, uh, the fall seminar series, series. Last time it was the turn of Greta Trigvason who nicely opened the series, and now we and now we have the second of the next uh, of a total of the six seminar series. Before leaving the word to Kumaran, who will chair the, the, the seminar, I will also like to mention that as Italian, I'm very proud because today, Giorgio Parisi won the Nobel Prize for Physics and it was several years uh, that we missed that Nobel Prize. So, so I would like to leave the floor to Kumaran for chairing the seminar and uh, thanks a lot again for joining. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alfredo, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this seminar series. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And uh, this promises to be an excellent talk because our speaker today is uh, Professor Sapurashi Basu from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, Sapurashi got his uh, BE from uh, Jadavpur University in West Bengal in the year 2000. And then he went to the US, to the University of Connecticut for his master's and PhD degrees in 2004 and 2007, respectively. And he has worked at uh, the uh, Florida State University and at the Indian Institute of Science, uh, rising now to the level of full professor. Uh, he has many achievements to his credit and uh, one of the most important is the DST Swanajanti Fellowship in Engineering Sciences. Uh, this is one of the highest uh, fellowships given to scientists working in India under the age of 40. And he has been one of the recipients in 2014. He is also a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and the elected fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, he works in the broad area of multi-phase flows uh, multi-scale transport, uh, micro and nanoscale transport, atomization, sprays, and combustion. And today he will give a talk on the spectacular voyage of droplets, all the way from gas turbines to COVID, which is a highly a timely topic for today. So with that, I'll hand over to Satyashi and request him to share his screen and give his talk. So let me just share the screen here. Uh, my screen is visible, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, thanks, Professor Kumaran, and thanks the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk. So today's uh, talk will be mainly focused on SARS-CoV-2. And if I get a little bit of time towards the end, we will try to cover a little bit on the gas turbines, just to show the disparity of length scales and uh, time scales that are used to solve this kind of problems. So, uh, but before I go into the, into the full talk, so this is in a nutshell of the, uh, essentially showing the research kaleidoscope of the type of work that we do. So on the top, what you can see is a highly swirling flow uh, with, the, with, the, with the inner and the outer shear layers and there is a vortex breakdown bubble. On the right-hand side, you can see a spray breakup and this middle screen actually shows uh, how the flame is anchored in such a swirling flow. And uh, we do a lot of work on shock droplet interaction, like what you can see over here. This is a recent publication in JFM where we actually showed that how a shock and a droplet interacts. This example is basically another JFM paper, which shows that how a vortex and a droplet actually interact. So you get this nice jellyfish type patterns. And at the same time, you also look at the instabilities in such uh, droplets while they are actually burning. For example, this is actually a burning droplet. And at the small scale, we also look at different phenomena. Like for example, this is a sessile droplet and how the asymmetric flow field actually develops, how to introduce mixing in droplets just by using vapor mediation. And uh, lastly, an interesting phenomena, which I call the Mojas effect. Uh, where we actually can use vapor mediation to split a droplet. 
So uh, some of these phenomena uh, can be shown or discussed later on, but this is not the not the not the topic for today's talk. So uh, I'll briefly introduce the team uh, for the SARS COVID related work. Uh, and these are Professor Chetoprabhu Chaudhary from University of Toronto, my own PhD student, ex-PhD student, Professor Obishek Shah, right now in University of California, San Diego, and my colleague, Professor Deepshika Chakraborty of uh, Molecular and Cell Biology. So with this team and a whole lot of students who are essentially acknowledged here, uh, we started doing this, uh, this work on COVID uh, precisely about a year from today, or maybe a little more than a year. So uh, before we start looking at the thing, let us look at that how a COVID-19 like pandemic actually spread. So this is a population where at week zero, W0, you have one infected person. And after n number of weeks, you get a lot of infected persons, infected persons being in bed. So the question that one can always ask is that how fast this disease actually spread? So a pandemic model that would normally be useful would actually predict that how this infection rate actually grows as a function of different variables, X1, X2, X3, and Xn. So essentially the pandemic models that you would normally encounter are complex and has very large uncertainty. And some of these uncertainties, what we felt as a group could be reduced by using this physics-based submodels, which is what we are going to describe next. So the understanding is, can we look at the small scale interactions? That means basically look at the droplet level phenomena to predict the growth of large scale pandemic. Can we derive such a model from the first principle? And then you can add on the complexities uh, as and when required. So this is how uh, a respiratory infection uh, spreads uh, through the respiratory droplet. So imagine this is an infected person so he coughs, sneezes, talks, breathes, whatever is the respiratory event. He basically ejects a cloud of these droplets, a cloud of essentially air containing these droplets. This cloud obviously expands and a healthy person actually uh, inhales them. And as he inhales, he or she, that person becomes infected in the process. So the respiratory droplets, as you can see over here, is uh, influenced by various types of events. Like for example, if you use a mask, obviously this cloud of droplets would be very different. Now this droplet clouds are basically, they grow because of entrainment effects. And within this cloud, the droplets evaporate, precipitate, and ultimately can form what we call the nuclei. And they are all influenced by the ambient weather conditions like temperature and relative humidity. Now, also that as these droplets are inhaled by the healthy subjects, uh, their infection potential is determined by the viral loading, the biology of the virus, and of course your uh, innate uh, immunity. So we decided that why not think about a pandemic model based on the age old chemical kinetics type of our theory, basically a collision model in which an infected person interacts with a susceptible person and uh, there is a some rate constant which determines that how this interaction actually happens. So this rate constant we imagine should be a function of time and the droplet lifetime and the droplet trajectory, everything should enter into this function K, which is essentially a rate constant to begin with. So based on this simple analogy, we decided to look a little further into the whole scheme of things. So the problems here are as fold. They are, these droplets are basically multi-component because they contain salt because of the saline and mucus and water and the virions. The respiratory droplets can undergo dispersion. Uh, they can settle. They undergo, can undergo evaporative cooling. They undergo crystallization. And their lifetimes are very complicated functions of temperature and relative humidity. On the other hand, the exhaled droplets to us can suffer only three phases. They can either transform to a nuclei, which is a fully evaporated or desiccated particle. They can settle on the surfaces as fomites, or they can remain as droplets while infecting. So all these three modes are essentially possible. So what we can do is that we can analyze the droplet physics relevant to the transport of such pathogens. We can design a pandemic model that will draw its input parameters from these droplet physics models. And then we can 
propose a pandemic model which can be more or less foolproof. Now, the methodology that we used are, we first do experiments with isolated droplets to see what their fates are, what is the evaporative lifetime. Then we can model the transport process and ultimately we look at the pandemic model. And then we look at that if we use face masks, what happens to such droplet transport? So the, essentially the talk is divided into such parts. So first let us see the experiments with the isolated droplets. So isolated droplets, why they are important? Because you need to know the precipitation dynamics. You need to know the fate of the virus in such precipitates. And you also need to know whether the presence of the virus alters the evaporation process or not. So what we used was a surrogate liquid. So the composition of the liquid was essentially 1% by weight of aqueous NaCl solution. Uh, we tried it with other uh, surrogate respiratory fluids also, in which we added leucine and similar such substances. And we added, instead of virus, we added 100 nanometer fluorescein nanoparticles as a virus substitute. So armed with this, we tried to look at what would be the fate of such droplets. And what did we use? We used an acoustic levitator. So the idea of using an acoustic levitator is simple. You get a contact-free environment for the droplet, okay, and you can do, you can watch the dynamics of the droplet using varieties of diagnostic techniques. Here, of course, it was laser-based scattering as well as high-speed imaging. So the initial droplet size was maintained at 500 microns, and we will see what is the significance of that. And we can assure that similar phenomena was observed also for lower size droplets. So we used different nanoparticle loading, uh, matching the virus loading that you would normally encounter in a cough or a, uh, or a sneeze. And we tried to look at what would be the fate of such droplets. So this is how the evaporation happens. Initially, the droplet shrinks in size. At around Ti, you start getting the onset of precipitation. After some time, the precipitation is complete. And then you form the final precipitate structure. As you can see, depending on whether there is nanoparticle or not, the structure of the precipitate doesn't really change that much. So if we look at the diameter reduction, this is d by d naught, okay? Without, without uh, when you just deal with pure water, okay, uh, you essentially follow a d square, a traditional d square type of a law profile, and this is what you get. Now, as you go on adding salt water into it, Initially, the evaporation doesn't matter, but slowly it starts to diverge because of the higher solute concentration at the interface, uh, which as far as you use Raoult's law, the uh, salt concentration increases at the interface, weakens the evaporation rate. So you get a longer evaporation time. And if you use now nanoparticles on the top of that, you virtually get no deviation in your evaporation time. The interesting part over here is the precipitation is always triggered at around d by d naught of about 0.2, regardless of the initial droplet size. So this is the point where the diameter regression actually freezes and you start getting the precipitation dynamics or the crystallization. So if you look at the Peclay number, the individual Peclay number, you would find that the, that the salt Peclay number dictates that the salt will perhaps homogenize, while the nanoparticles won't be. And so, so if you, if so, this is the essential part is that the, the, the nucleation or the precipitation of the salt may not really start at the boundary of the, of the droplet. And this is exactly something similar that we see in our precipitation dynamic study. Forget about these unique structures. These unique structures are due to the acoustic pressure field of the levitator. But as you can see that the laser scattering shows that there is no localized solidification. It starts from everywhere. And ultimately you get a crystal of this particular type. So these are actual uh, time result images. Now what we did was that we took one of these crystal out and then we observed it under an SEM and under a confocal microscopy where we wanted to see that how the virions are actually embedded in this part in these uh, crystals. So what we saw was something very interesting, that most of the nanoparticles, they are actually fossilized. So they are within the crystal, and none of them actually reside on the surface per se. Uh, so the nanoparticles are distributed within the crystal. Very few of them actually protrude out. So they are mostly embedded or fossilized. 
So that means if you intake one of these crystal through your breathing process, you are basically inhaling a very high dosage of virions also because the virus load, the, the virions are all conserved. They don't vaporize. So this diameter is rather small. So you get a high concentration of virions uh, inside your system as soon as you intake such, uh, such crystals. The only point is that whether the virus survives within this crystal matrix or not, that is a question for the biologist to answer. So the insights that we get is that the salt diffuses faster than the evaporation process. So you get a more homogeneous precipitation and the, the nanoparticles, essentially here the virus-like particles, they do not affect the evaporation precipitation or the crystallization process. So next we go to the modeling of such transport processes of these respiratory droplets to see. So now we know what we are dealing with. So the idea here is that there are varieties of models that can be done uh, all the way from a very high quality DNS type of simulation to a very crude first order type models. We have to see which one actually serves the purpose better because ultimately you want to use it in a pandemic model. So uh, too much of a fluid dynamics time scale or high computation time can actually defeat the purpose. So it has to be simple enough to use in a large scale pandemic model. So essentially here also use, we use one weight percent of aqueous NACL solution and no need to model the virus because it does not have any significant effect on the droplet transport and the lifetime as we saw from our experiments. So the idea was to have an Eulerian flow field description and do a Lagrangian droplet tracking one-way coupling because ultimately we assume that the droplets that you exhale as a part of your respiratory process um, are highly dilute and they become more dilute as the cloud expands. And uh, of course, uh, we used a very fast transport within the droplets. It's a homogeneous droplet model, but we also have a 2D liquid phase model, uh, which is also there. Uh, but as we can see, the results do not really vary by that much. So the model can be described into several components. The first one is of course the respiratory jet and the puff model, that is the aerodynamics of the droplet. And then of course you have heat and mass transfer of the droplet. And lastly, parallelly, you have the evaporation and the precipitation dynamics. So uh, th this is uh, for example, a violent cup event, I think from the paper of Lydia and John Bush. So this is what uh, you, the structure that you actually get. So, idea is that the droplets co-flow the volume of air that is actually exhaled. So the exhaled air initially behaves like a turbulent jet because you have a continuous momentum source, but then it transforms to a turbulent puff because your momentum source is cut off after a certain point of time, which is roughly about a second, order of a second. So this is the turbulent jet equation, and this is the turbulent puff equation. So if you have some matching functions, you can basically track what will be the change in the droplet, the cloud diameter, and the gas phase velocity as, the, as your puff transitions from a jet to a puff. And this is precisely what we have done. Then the aerodynamics of the droplet is rather simple. You can, you can see this is a pretty much a simple drag model. And then you introduce the stroke settling velocity inside it. Then the model description for the heat and mass transfer is even simpler. So for the evaporation rate, this is the standard form. This is SH star is the, is the modified Sherwood number, BM being the Spalding mass transfer number. And the mass fraction of water in the gas phase, they are incorporated in this particular way. The effect of dissolved non-volatile components, here it is the salt is accounted for okay, in the Rawls law. And the crystallization is also a single step crystallization model where we actually study the growth rate of the crystal without any inherent, uh, inherent 3D length scales involved. And that, lastly, the energy balance within the droplet is given by a simple, as I said, fast trans, uh, uh, homogeneous transport model. Uh, so the, there is a 2D version of this model where we actually account for the complete transport within the droplet, both for the species as well as for the energy uh, that is available in this particular paper, just live as we speak. The model is a derivative of the, of the model proposed by Bill Shirimiano. Uh, it's, a, it's a long, it's a, it's a model which is quite well known uh, in, the, in, the, in the literature. So 
we can see the modeling results. So the experimental results are ours from the levitator, whereas we see the model over here. So as you can see, the match is quite decent and it has a good agreement with experiments. It can even predict the knee formation. Okay, and it actually predicts that the knee forms around uh, D by D not around 0.2. So this is very good agreement. Using this, what we can do is that we can draw a modified Wells curve, where if you study it carefully, you will see that droplets, which are beyond a certain time scale, okay, either they become nuclei or they settle on the ground, okay, because of the convergence of the two curves. And only the diameters which are between D1 and D2 actually can remain in the droplet form at that particular time scale. So this is of course taken at 21 degrees Celsius and relative humidity of 50%. So the large droplets settle quickly, smaller droplets evaporate quickly and remain airborne as they do that. So this is the premise and this is the diagram that you can draw. What we can do is that using this diagram, now you can calculate what will be the diameter of the cloud, for example, and what will be the distance that the droplet will travel. So what it shows uh, to summarize these two figures in a nutshell, that the droplet lifetime is much higher for high humidity and low temperature. That means cold weather and high humidity is very, very detrimental. And longer distance means, longer lifetime means that the droplet can travel much larger distance more than the six feet distance that normally people advocate. Okay, but this is just the transmission part, that means how far the droplets can travel, how to incorporate it in a, in a pandemic model is what I'm going to show next. So uh, cold and humid weather essentially extend the droplet lifetime. It can go beyond six feet. The 10 micron to 100 micron droplets are more lethal because they stay for the longest duration of time, as you can saw in that modified well curve. The droplet nuclei, however, the desiccated droplets, now that we know that corona can actually spread through aerosols, they can survive and travel much further than the droplets themselves, but there is a catch that we will see in the next few slides. So now we move on to describe a little bit of the pandemic model uh, based on such droplet physics. So as I said, already introduced the model that, okay, let's assume that there are five types of uh, uh, possible outcomes, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, and diseased. So what you can see is that you, uh, you, you basically exhale a cloud of droplets, which is what we see. And this cloud expands with a diameter, which is given by sigma d. And the person, the susceptible person can inhale about uh, a volume of air, which is given by a diameter of sigma s. And uh, so these are, so, or a, we assume a mortality of about 3%. As you can see, that K1 alpha beta actually signifies the infection rate constant, where alpha is the type of respiratory events. It can be coughing, sneezing, breathing, whatever mode that you want. And B is the mode of transmission. That means whether it is droplet, nuclei, or fumite. Okay, so this is a pretty, uh, pretty robust type of an infection rate constant. As you can see, there can be 17 equations that you can actually formulate out of these. And, uh, and ideally, as I said already earlier, this K1 should depend on a lot of things, like the droplet lifetime, the, the, the velocity of propagation. Velocity means the velocity of the droplet and the velocity of the susceptible person. That means the mobility of the person in general. It can also have a dependence on the location. That means uh, it can have, uh, if you have a high population density pockets, like for example, some part of India versus a very sparsely dispersed uh, kind of a situation, uh, these rates will be very different. So this is what the framework that you have in this particular problem. So without going too much from the, from the theory, so ultimately, and this can be again read in the paper, uh, you, the infection rate constant now can be passed in this particular way where this sigma ds is the spread of the droplet cloud, which comes from the droplet model that I showed. Vds is the velocity of the droplet, which comes again from the droplet model. And lastly, this is the in generalized infection probability, right? Which also includes a parameter, which is n alpha beta, which depends on the viral load, the half-life of the virus, the droplet cloud, frequency of the respiratory events, and all these parameters. 
So what we have tried to introduce over here, uh, of course, the details are there in the paper, that the droplet can model can provide most of these input parameters that you need to solve this infection rate problem. And this is precisely what we are going to do next. So this is the infection probability from a calf event. Let's look at a calf event where D denotes droplets, N denotes the nuclei, and this is the combined probability. So this is time and this is the distance. Essentially, the curves looks the same, right? So what happens here is as uh, when the time is short, that means at the point where you actually do a, a respiratory event like coughing, you will find that the probability that if you are there, the probability of infection is very high. And most of that comes from the droplet mode, right? Because the nuclei takes a little bit of time to form. So nuclei mode starts to become, uh, starts to grow as you, uh, and as you, as the droplet traverses a little bit in that cloud, uh, in that, in that cloud uh, that is, that is exhaled with your cough and this cloud gets di diluted. So what happens is that you can see that the probability of the droplet comes sharply down because most of the droplets are now converted either to fomites or they are converted to the nuclear. So it comes down sharply, whereas the probability of the nuclear infection goes up. And because of the fact that you are now putting more nuclear into the business. But however, you can see that even though nuclear mode becomes pretty dominant after a certain point of time, the probability is still quite low. This is simple reason is that you get concomitant dilution of your jet. That means your droplet dispersion actually increases. So the chances of, because when you breathe in, you have to breathe in a certain number of virions to be infected. So if you just inject, for example, one virion, the chances of you developing an infection is rather low. So because it is very diluted now, though you are inhaling uh, the droplet nuclei, uh, the probability of you getting the lethal dose of virions becomes much, much lower. So this actually comes down after some time. So the droplet mode of infection is very dominant in the initial time instance, whereas the nuclei remains airborne for a much longer time, as you can see, 10 to the power of three seconds, and for a much longer distance as well. But the probability, the catch is, the probability of you getting infected from that comes down quite a bit. So the droplet plays a very important role. So somebody coughs in front of you and you're within like three feet distance, this can be pretty detrimental. Whereas uh, it can be still, you can still get infected. Say if you are a meter or uh, I mean two, three meters away because the nuclei can still cause the infection, but then you have the catch that you may not inhale the adequate number of virions that are needed for the infection to happen. So the results from the model is very simple. As you can see that the susceptible number comes down and ultimately the recovered number should also go up. And in between you should have the, the exposed and the infected population. Now, what we decided is that uh, you can introduce an artificial cutoff. That means what you can do is that if you wear a mask, for example, on your face, um, the, what is the mask supposed to do? The mask is supposed to block droplets which are larger than a certain value. Say, for example, that number is 10 microns. So if it blocks droplets which are larger than 10 microns, that means you introduce a cutoff in your probability model. What happens is that you get the infected number won't rise in that way. Whenever you introduce the mask, for example, here the mask is introduced on the 30th day because of the very low latency period, that means the infection develops within a day, uh, you will have a very sharp decay of the infected mass. Uh, so it shows that why masking has worked in most of the cases, because it essentially acts as a blocker for droplets beyond a certain size range. And, uh, and this is actually proven if you plug in the numbers in the model. So what we have shown is that you can, we can develop a pandemic model for the first principle, the droplet level transport controls the most important rate constant, which shows that how uh, a susceptible person can get infected. And the risk from the droplet remains very close to the source. That means when you're talking with somebody in close vicinity or in close spaces, uh, the chances of you getting an infection is rather high. Uh, but the risk from the droplet nuclei remains high for a long time and far from the source, albeit with a lower probability. 
And as you can see, that the mask can reduce the infection rate significantly. But then we decided that there may be a little bit of a twist to this mask story. And that is what we are going to just uh, show next in the time available. So let's look at the story of the masks, the face masks. So the face masks, as you can see, normally what you see, it acts as a filter. So it reduces the, the distance that are traveled by the respiratory jets. It also reduces the droplet count. And naturally, people have seen that this actually acts as a very good inhibitor and people should use it. So we decided that to look into a little bit more details because especially in countries like, like uh, for example, India, where uh, you know, N95 and surgical masks may not be available all the time. So uh, we decided to look a little bit deep and see what happens to the individual droplets as they come out of our mouth. So we decided to have a little bit of a, a, a experimental apparatus in which we once again used a surrogate respiratory fluid. This time we used gastric mucin as well. Uh, we used a droplet size range of 250 to about 1.2 millimeter. And then we uh, used a droplet dispenser with a velocity of anywhere between two to 10 meter per second. This is typical for a cough. That means if you cough, if it's a mild cough, it will have about a velocity of two to three, four meter per second. If it's a violent cough, it will go more like 10 meter per second. And then you impinge these droplets on a mask fabric and see what happens. So these masks are surgical masks. Uh, so what we did is that we took a single layer of these masks. So this is a single layer. This is a corresponding double layer. This is a corresponding triple layer. So these are all surgical masks. One is medical grade, one is locally supplied. So let us look at the droplet impact. So for a single layer, wow. So you see an uh, astonishing number of droplets actually penetrating and coming out to the other side. So this is outward uh, protection. So your outward protection goes for a toss. Uh, double layer mask performs significantly better and triple layer is obviously the best, but sometimes you do get a droplet coming out. Now, what is the interesting part of this? As you can see, these droplets are quite large to begin with. They are 250 to about 1.2 mm. So normally these droplets, as per the Wells curve, they would actually settle on the ground very quickly within like a feet or two from, your, from the moment it comes out of your mouth. But what happens after this atomization process, these droplets now become smaller in size. So the chances of them becoming aerosolized is rather high. And what we see is penetration formation as some kind of an extrusion process and atomization into the smaller droplets. And you get very negligible penetration and atomization in the case of a triple layer mask. So if you just do a very simple criteria for droplet penetration, which is basically the initial kinetic energy of the droplet and the energy that is dissipated, and you propose a penetration criteria where the uh, kinetic energy should be much, much higher than the dissipation energy, uh, this, this criteria actually shows that your penetration is independent of the droplet size, but it dependent on the impact velocity. So the impact velocity is important, the TM, which is basically the thickness of the mask is important. The pore size is of course important, but uh, it is not dependent on the any droplet size, so long as the droplet is larger than the pore size. And you do it with different impact velocity and you see, yeah, you get more or less a uh, very similar type of behavior. That means when this, uh, this Reynolds number, uh, this can be passed in the form of Reynolds number, when it is much, much greater than one, you do have uh, penetration, otherwise you don't. So the red actually means that there is no penetration happening. Indeed, if you plot this diameter versus impact velocity over the range that we have concerned, we can see that indeed the droplet, the impact velocity, okay, is more or less the same impact velocity at which the penetration happens is more or less the same across a very large droplet size range. So this droplet penetration is independent of the initial droplet diameter. Now, the most important part of this is not this, but to study that what is the diameter distribution that you get from the atomization of a single drop, uh, such, a, such a large drop, which is of the order of 620 microns uh, or, or, or thereabout. So as you can see there, uh, we have put an artificial marker over here because anything less than 100 is a possible aerosolization uh, regime. 
So you can see a large fraction of the droplets actually do fall in the aerosolization region. Okay, so this is rather, rather critical. That means that if you wear a single layer mask and if you sneeze or you cough, you generate a lot of droplets which are there in the aerosolization region. And the penetration is rather high for a single layer mask, which is roughly of the order of 70%. And out of that, quite a bit of the percentage actually falls in that critical region. Remember, this, of course, will be this is volume. So naturally, this will be of a lower percentage, but the number count is quite large. That means from a single droplet, you generate 100 to 132 droplets, which are falls in that particular region. So poor quality mask, basically what it does, it shifts the PDF to the left. So that means smaller size droplets are formed, which is detrimental. And the smaller size droplets can therefore evaporate and aerosolize, which we just saw, and they can travel longer distances, which we just proved. And you can see it viscosity uh, doesn't have much of an effect because DI water and surrogate cup droplet essentially show very similar uh, droplet size distribution, probability distribution. We also looked at uh, from now from the Indian Institute of Science perspective. There was, um, we also tried to do a little bit of an outreach study where we wanted to see this homemade mask. Now people use all kinds of things. Uh, they put a handkerchief, they can put summer stole, they can put uh, you know cotton towel, whatever it is they can get hold of. The main problem of those are surgical masks have got very low pore size, but all the other specimens, they actually are of large pore size. So there lies the problem. Okay, and uh, so these are the different types of such, uh, you know, such fabrics that people use for their day-to-day -day applications. Here, of course, we modified the criteria a little bit. So apart from having the resistance due to viscous dissipation, because it works when the pore sizes are rather small, but you also need to now account for the surface tension effects in the pores of the fabric. So basically you have a two-part criteria. One is the Reynolds number criteria, and the other is the Weber number criteria. So if a mask uh, satisfies both or does not satisfy both, uh, it will not penetrate. It will penetrate when its kinetic energy satisfies both these constraints. So that is the, that is the, the, that is the two-step criteria. And indeed, if you look at it, this criteria is rather robust because as you can see, uh, the mask which satisfies both criteria actually are few and far in between, masks which are normally penetrates actually have a weapon number now much greater than one. So what we have seen here is uh, many things now matters, the pore size, the porosity, and the fabric thickness. So all these things combined gives us a two-part criteria, which basically dictates whether a mask, a uh, single layer mask, once again, can be a good uh, protector on outward protection uh, for your, uh, when you actually go out uh, to, to intermingle. So you also proposed what we call a new combined criteria for the fabric characterization. So what we saw is that it's not just the pore size and the porosity, right? Uh, so an increase in pore size, what it will do is that it will cause longer ligaments to form. Increase in porosity on the other hand for a constant pore size leads to the formation of a higher number of ligaments. So, uh, so it is not just that you can reduce one without reducing the other. So as you can see the volume penetration over here for this combined criteria, where it is uh, the porosity is being normalized by the pore size square, you find that the maximum volume penetration happens for a certain intermediate value. Okay, anything higher or lower than that gives you lower penetration. So when you design a mask, that is something to look forward to. But once again, the characteristics remains the same. You do get a lot of droplets in the aerosolization regime, even here. We also did a very small study in which we studied that how the wash cycles of the mask can be important. So the wash cycles of the mask are particularly interesting because many people just wash their masks. So they just don't throw it away. So these are, for example, two types of masks after 10 wash and 70 wash. So as long as their porosity and the fiber uh, reliability is there, that means it's not torn anywhere, uh, you do not get a significant difference in the droplet uh, size distribution. They are more or less very similar to begin with if you use a single layer of such masks. So the deterioration is not that high, provided the mask is not torn. 
So the insights from such studies is that improper masking blocks the larger droplets, but can lead to the generation of the smaller droplet counts, which can have a larger lifetime and hence can be very detrimental. So you can have a theoretical condition for this proper filtering. Uh, so, but the idea is of course, use any face mask that is possible. So the idea is not to say that don't use face masks, okay? So this is, uh, this, is, this is a comprehensive part of our COVID related studies. So in the next five minutes or so, I'll try to cover a little bit of the gas turbine side of things. Uh, so there is one part which I left out was the fomites, but that is a story for some other day that how the fomite uh, type of infections can actually happen. But that story we can cover some other time. Okay. So now let us, now we have seen all this world in which it's mass, droplet, single droplet evaporation and all these things. Now we just take a five minutes, uh, you know, just pause and try to look at a bigger scale of things, which is essentially gas turbine engines, uh, widely considered to be the most complicated device ever made in, on earth, just because uh, billions of dollars are invested and uh, this is uh, everything that we see actually runs on gas turbines, uh, more or less. And uh, at the heart of the gas turbine, that small yellow region is basically where the fuel is injected into a highly turbulent swirling flow. And you want the flame to be anchored there. You want the droplets to be well atomized, well mixed, so that you get a very stable combustion. And then, uh, so, so, the idea is this particular type of injectors and flow strategies should work for all kinds of fuels, even bio-derived fuels. And so the ultimate holy grail for any such research is to achieve robust, stable, low emissions, liquid fuel combustion with a degree of fuel flexibility. So we, I would just take a small component and show that what we can do for this kind of work. So the motivation we already accounted for, there's a lot of industry, uh, industrial challenge, and uh, there is a lot of things that, uh, that can be done. But essentially to take care of everything, if you just look at the picture on the bottom, you can see that what happens is the fuel should undergo atomization, form droplets, undergo phase change from the vapor field, mix with the oxidizer, and ultimately give rise to combustion, right? So this additional time scale of tau evaporation actually enters into the picture. So smaller the size of the droplets, lower is this evaporation time and you get a very well mixed vapor field. So this is very easy to say, not so easy to do. So this is what it exactly looks like. So this is, uh, this is for example, a swirling flow field, what you can see coming out. And this is an interesting thing. What you can see in the background is a spray that would normally come out without any swirl. But as soon as you flush air through it, Okay, you see that dancing uh, sheets. Let's see if I can play it once. Yeah, so you can see the sheet actually dancing. Okay, so uh, so this is how it. There is a lot of flapping and a lot of uh, crazy things that actually goes on. So uh, the idea is that can we understand this and can we use this to develop new type of injectors? So that is the whole whole point of this study. So this is what a uh, experimental setup looks like without going into too much details. Uh, that the heart of this particular process is the swirling flow. Now the swirling flow has at its base, if you look at the structure of the swirling flow, there is something called a vortex breakdown bubble. So this is the vortex breakdown bubble. And then there is an inner shear layer that you see around, and then there is an outer shear layer that you see. So this is the main structure and whatever liquid that you're pumping comes and interacts with this particular swirling structure. If you anchor a flame, the flame will be stabilized across this structure and it will uh, give rise to whatever combustion that you want to have. So I will skip this particular slide and this. So we did some fun experiments. So we had this uh, swirling flow and we retrofitted it with an injector in the middle. What we tried to do is that uh, this is called a geometric swirl number, which is basically the, the momentum ratio, the tangential momentum versus the axial momentum. And we propose two important quantities. One is a Reynolds number, the gas phase. And other one is called the momentum ratio, which is basically the momentum of the airflow versus the liquid flow. So normally MR should be a quantity which will be rather uh, large. Uh, because the airflow is normally supposed to be very high. Uh, 
So this is what the, and when you actually stop the air, MR goes to zero. That means it's just a simple spray to begin with. So based on this, let us look at what we can get. So th this is a swirling flow field. This place, as you can see, this is a high speed PID. And these are the corresponding uh, modal decompositions, uh, basically proper orthogonal decompositions. As you can see, though the, this is played at, these are of different uh, gas phase Reynolds number, uh, but you can see, if I play it one more time, the low Reynolds number, the high Reynolds number flow topology remains more or less the same. So the mode one is, is usually the Kelvin Helmholtz mode. Mode two is the strong shear mode. And then of course you have mode three helical and then mode four is a vortex shedding mode. So a rather complicated flow to begin with, but they retain certain flow characteristics. And of course, the time average snapshots will give you a central recirculation bubble as well as two shear lips along with it. So these are this is what the swirling flow actually looks like. Now, when you actually pump in the spray, there is a momentum coupling down. So this is MR equal to zero. That means no flow, nice and easy. The, the spray is very symmetrical, as you can see. Okay. Now, this is at a momentum ratio of about 338. Which is, uh, which, is great, which is just about optimum for the spray to show some interaction with, with the airflow, as you can see. Once again, at the background, you have this. And then, of course, when you actually have MR equal to 6,100, you get this vigorous flapping of the liquid sheet. Okay, And uh, let's not bother about the math part a little bit. So this is a strong interaction. This is a recirculation induced breakup. And this is the only spray region. Now, what you can see over here is, of course, there is certain things that happens that leads to the dancing of the liquid sheet and the fragmentation of the liquid sheet. So, what we did was that we did also a liquid phase, uh, liquid phase POV, and we studied the modal frequency of the two. Now, the one interesting part that you get is that when your momentum ratio is less than a critical value the modal frequency of the spray, that means the liquid phase and the gas phase are widely disparate. That means they don't talk to each other. When you actually march on to this momentum ratio, which is just about equal to the MRC of the jet, you start to get this very strong interaction. Basically the frequencies becomes the same. So the gas phase basically imposes on the liquid phase and they lockstep with each other. So the combined gas phase POD reveals the dominance of this gas phase pH instability uh, beyond a certain critical MR. So this was another interesting observation. And uh, the other interesting observation that we will show is that typically people look at the breakup criteria as a Weber number T, where T is basically the thickness of the jet and you propose certain values, which, is, which works very well when you do not have any, uh, any flow at all. But when you actually have a very strong MR and you have very strong asymmetry, uh, the Weber number should be redefined. Actually, it can be redefined in two ways. It can be the Weber number based on the circulation strength, because if you look at it here, this is basically the how the rotation of the gas phase happens, because you saw the flapping. So that actually determines that how this sheet is going to be broken. So you can have, have a, a rotation based uh, or a circulation based Weber number, or you can also propose a very similar Weber number based on the vorticity layer thickness, which is delta G. Both are basically equivalent to each other in that particular way. So we are reproposing or repurposing that what will be the correct Weber number for this application. So the breakup mechanism, therefore, are of two, uh, varieties of parts. When there is no flow, you get absence of pH vortices, you get uh, very nice. Uh, sheet breakup, which is given by the Weber number T, which everybody knows. When it is at that critical value, you get the, the recirculation bubble expanding the sheet. And uh, so, and lastly, when you actually have a much higher value of this MRC, you get a lot of this turbulence and a sheet breakup. And there the frequency of the liquid sheet matches with the pH mode. And uh, a very high Weber number, which is represented by the circulation strength is responsible for this. So uh, we always think how industry can use it and how we can use it. So we develop what we call a regime map. So you have a MR versus the Weber number, which is the repurposed Weber number. And you can see you can have this very nice transitions and the different breakup modes 
And obviously, we also calculated what would be the droplet sizes, but in the interest of time, that is not what we are going to show over here. So, and this is a very nice, uh, you know, flow chart which says that how this atomization actually takes place, the mechanism. And I will just take one minute now to complete this presentation, where we say that, okay, based on all these nice fundamental understandings, can we develop some new injectors? And this is exactly what we did. And this is our version of a high shear injector in which now you use two swirlers and you use a venturi and a flare. And you basically have the same recirculation bubble that you see over here. And you try to see how you can get best atomization of the liquid. And then you use a certain number of you know, a grid spacing basically to characterize the spray. So uh, these are all shown, these are of different uh, mean flow characteristics, but the interesting part lies in these two slides at the bottom. And this is what is relevant for the industry also. You get very good patternation, which means the azimuthal symmetry of the distribution of the volume of the spray. So this is uh, very nice because you get a very nice distribution, which means when these droplets actually now go and evaporate, they will generate probably a very nice mean uh, well mixed flow field, which will have a very nice combustion characteristics. And you also get an as average SMD across all these locations, which is under 20 microns, actually in the order of 15 microns or so, using this uh, class of high shear injectors. So what we did is that we basically control the flow. By controlling the flow characteristics, we controlled the spray patternation and we got remarkable uh, SMDs. So this is a new type of high shear injectors uh, which we devised and patented both. So with this, I end my uh, end my presentation. There are a lot of things that are there as well, but this is to just give a journey uh, of the droplets in very two disparate applications. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Professor Basu. Uh, are there any questions? Are there any questions on the YouTube channel? Uh, I have a question. Uh, um, yeah, so, please go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, Saptashi, um, yeah. the, um, when, uh, in your um, COVID uh, um, talk, uh, um, in the part where mm -hmm. you developed uh, a infection model, yeah. um, I, I, could not fully uh, follow uh, because there's a lot of details. So, so one question I have is, um, um, if you take a room, a hospital room, or a classroom, or a restaurant, etc., um, yeah. when you have a certain ejector, the pattern of flow ventilation does seem like it should play a big role. Yeah. So, and in your model, you it doesn't seem to appear anywhere. So I know this Basant and Bush paper, they simply assume a well-mixed model. Uh, some such uh, um, assumption about the flow must be implied uh, in yours to be able to yes. make predictions. Uh, um, so I first want to hear uh, uh, how you handle that. Yeah, so, the, so here, of course, as you are right, this is not valid for an indoor application per se, because as you can see that aerosol loading that you saw, because a cloud will move and then ultimately it should supposed to stop because when it reaches the room size and all those things. And in the absence of ventilation, it will remain that way. But if you have a ventilation, then you have to have the sucking motion that how this is will be carried away. So this is essentially for large spaces, if I might say. But the idea was that, of course, this is what we did. And there is a lot of work that is continuing where we kind of trying to retrofit it and now try to see how it can be applied to the indoor conditions. But the idea was to prepare a framework where you can actually have these, you know, the volume as well as the droplet lifetime. And you can feed it into a pandemic model and to show basically the connection. So as I said, that uh, you can do a lot with the flow because this is not a perfect model to begin with. Uh, so you can have for indoor conditions, you can have ventilation, you can make your model very, uh, I mean, a lot more complicated than what it is right now. But as you are, as you correctly said, this is mainly for large spaces. This is not for confinements 
and ventilation is obviously not taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Even in large spaces, uh, wouldn't uh, the ambient flow conditions say, yes. whether it's in a beach or whether there's a cross flow, so yes. ambient turbulence levels will play a big role because within maybe even a few seconds, the puffs uh, intensity drops off so fast that the ambient turbulence uh, plays a role. So yes. right now, in your case, it is in the absence of very um, vigorous turbulence, so in case so no external flow. There's no yeah. external, this, this is just the jet and the puff as it comes out and, and how it, uh, you know, dilutes in the environment. But obviously, you're right, you can have a cross flow, you can have a lot of mixing from the surrounding air. So those things are still work in progress. And there is, uh, I mean, we are actually doing that study, how to incorporate the ambient effect. As you can see, this is a tough problem uh, to, to tackle. Uh, to begin with so but the but our idea was very simple if you look at the acrd models that are normally available they are very ad hoc i mean i might offend a few epidemiologists but they are very ad hoc in the sense that they whatever model that you choose none of them have got the droplet physics or the droplet aerodynamics plugged in uh, so we tried to incorporate that now of course there are this you know simplifying assumptions to begin with so what we are trying to incorporate right now is still a work in progress at that level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? If there are no more questions, I will have one more question. Um, um, so that idea of um, the uh, droplets uh, becoming crystallized uh, was very interesting. Uh, um, now, um, this is uh, not necessarily fluid mechanic, just out of curiosity, I'm asking. So if one breathes in this uh, crystals, uh, um, then it uh, sort of deposits in your nasal uh, cavity or something, then it melts. So the idea is that whatever the virus load that is in there will be fully operational and will possibly, so whether the virus is in the surface or at the interior wouldn't matter. They all will be viable candidates of uh, infection. Is that the thought process? Yeah, so the thought process is essentially that, but I let me give you a simple example that we tried, we, I did not present it here. We tried to do a similar experiment with bacteria. So mm -hmm. there we found that, well, bacteria are very different. So, uh, so there we found that if you stress the bacteria, like this is a form of stress, now the bacteria viability number comes down quite a bit. That means if there are 10 bacteria which are viable, initially there will be like two the bacteria will be viable but their virulence factor goes up. So for the virus, uh, unfortunately, there is no detailed study like this, that okay, when you crystallize them and then you, as you say, remail to them, that whether their potency remains the same or not. Uh, but this is one important part of the study. And now that ISD has now a BSL-3 facility. So we are planning to do some of this levitator work that you just saw using the pseudovirus or actually using the SARS-CoV and see that whether the, the virulence factor is actually maintained, which basically answers your question that if you, uh, if the bacteria is deep inside and it is clustered, probably they will be clustered together. Uh, when you actually remelt them, whether they maintain the same level of virulence that when you normally suck a droplet, which contains the bacteria in a mobile form, that means it's still in the liquid phase. That is a question that is still not properly answered as far as what we saw from the literature. And that is what something that we want to, you know, do in the next uh, few months or so. Can you please go back to the slide 77, where you have the movie of the droplet atomization, the jet atomization? Uh, your voice is very faint. Ah, is my voice? Uh, is no, it not coming? There was a question. Oh, my, my voice is very faint. Uh, 
Now it's better? Yeah, now it's better, yes. Okay, thank you. So can you please go to slide 77? To the movie where, the, where we can see this uh, accumulation of droplets. Uh, you, we can't hear you. Uh, you yes. were loud, but then you faded out. So maybe I will ask my question in a chat, all right? It will be easier, perhaps. Um, maybe I will take that opportunity to ask one more question. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. no, he has, he has written the question. Go ahead. Yeah. Is atomization stochastic or deterministic process? That is for the more, you know, uh, so that is more for, I think, Bala and other people who are more computational to answer that. But, uh, uh, but strangely so, that is what my experience has been, right? With the, with the, with the droplet size distributions, if you're talking about the statistics, yes. Okay, it seems to have uh, that deterministic feature. Yes, but it's left for more I mean, Bala and others to answer it from a more mathematical perspective. But your model, the you use is deterministic in your model, right? I think that may be the question. Oh, this is from the, I thought it was from the gas turbine part. Is it not? Or? With the other part. So, and yeah. my answer was on specific to the gas turbine part of the question. Gas turbine, right? Yeah. So, you want to bring it to your closure? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we are right on the dot at 8 p.m. here, uh, exactly one hour. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Saparishi Basu for uh, a very interesting talk and for maintaining the time. Uh, I'd like to thank IJMF for organizing this wonderful series and for uh, giving us the opportunity to listen to these lectures, uh, Bala and Alfredo. And I'd like to thank Gail and uh, Ted for doing all of the organization. Uh, those of us who actually do scientific work are very often technologically challenged and it's great to have them here with us to do all of this work. And with that, I'd like to uh, close the session. Especially thank you all for attending and see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. everyone. Yeah, thank you.